Hello and welcome to the channel. Uh, today we're continuing with our engine rebuild and uh, it's going to be time to look at the cylinders. Now if you'd watched the previous episode, uh, you know that we took the cylinder heads off, uh, dismantled it, and um, measured everything. And uh, everything came out looking in really good shape, almost suspiciously good shape. Um, so we don't have any concerns so far. Um, we've uh, currently got the heads in a box, uh, just waiting valve seals, which come with our gasket kit. And um, yeah, but before we can order the gasket kit, uh, we need to take a look at the cylinders themselves. We need to confirm the bore so that we don't accidentally order the wrong rings. And uh, perhaps most importantly, making sure that everything's in good enough shape that we can repair this engine. Um, this would be the time, if you're going to find a deal breaker, a lot of times it's going to be in the cylinder walls where um, uh, oil starvation or uh, a seizing type situation, a, a piston will essentially crash into the side of the cylinder. And uh, that's obviously not a good situation. If you get deep gouges in there, uh, you might be looking at a situation where you need to overboard the engine. Um, and it might even just be less trouble to just pick up a new block. So um, that'll be the name of the game today. I'm going to start by um, removing the pistons or removing the cylinders off the bike. And uh, for these bikes, it's a little bit weird. There's one kind of kind of silly little bolt there that holds the thing on. Um, don't know what it's really for. I guess you can make the case it's there to save your gasket if you just want to do a head gasket. Uh, you don't necessarily want to do a cylinder gasket. This bolt might be a way to preserve that cylinder gasket. But um, anyway, it's very easy to overlook. So ensure that you remove this bolt before you try uh, try getting the cylinders off. Or else you're just going to end up in a world of frustration. But yeah, so you remove that little tiny bolt. And uh, you can remove the cylinders the same way. Uh, just be careful. If you're dealing with uh, questionable rings, uh, they might want to kick out some debris as you pull these off. So try to keep a rag underneath them. I don't do a very good job of that here, but um, as I say, just kind of be aware. Now as with the cylinder head, once we've got the um, cylinders on the bench, you want to clean them up. Uh, I gave this a little solvent bath, just to make it nice and shiny. And uh, we're going to go ahead and remove any remnants of the head gasket. Again, we're going to use a razor blade for this, and uh, we exactly the same process as with the, uh, the cylinder head itself. Again, just make sure not to gouge the surface too much, and um, take your time, make sure there's no uh, debris left in place. Now again, we'll use an air hose to blow out any of the debris from any of the nooks and crannies. Um, just as with before, you don't want any of this stuff ending up in your oil passages, or even the coolant passages. Now we can check the cylinders for warpage. Um, so we're going to locate uh, an appropriately sized shim. For this particular engine, the maximum warpage is three thousandths of an inch. Um, and then we're just going to lay our straight edge across in uh, the front and rear, as well as both diagonals, as well as the um, the verticals, or I guess the y-axis. Yeah, I'm gonna continue to go with y-axis. Now we get our bore gauge and we measure the cylinder bore top. Um, we're going to do this in um, the X and the Y axis. And ideally you want to do this in the top, middle and bottom of each of the um, cylinders and write these down in a space you can remember them because we're going to need these to calculate uh, cylinder taper as well as out of round. 
as well obviously as bore. And the bore for all these came in just fine. Um, so this engine has not been bored out before. This is a standard bore. Now to calculate cylinder taper, um, we subtract the cylinder bore bottom measurement from the cylinder bore top measurement for all four cylinders. And we do this separately for the X and the Y. Uh, for this engine, we actually found um, very low wear, or at least very low taper. Um, for the X axis, the one that goes across the engine or um, parallel to the crankshaft, uh, we basically couldn't measure any. Uh, so we got zeros across the board for those. And for the cylinder taper Y, or perpendicular to the crank, uh, we came up with four ten thousandths of an inch. Service limit is four thousandths of an inch. So we're well within service limits. And um, that's better than I expected. Uh, normally a bike with six, well, an engine with 60,000 kilometers on it. Depending on how it's been maintained and how it's been run, you will tend to see uh, more of a taper in the Y axis. That's just a result of the the motion of the pistons and the fact that they're constrained along the x-axis by the con rods. And for the out of round, which is essentially how oblong the cylinders are, um, you subtract the cylinder bore x from the cylinder bore y for all four cylinders. And you do this for the top and uh, middle and bottom measurements, or in our case, just the top and the bottom. And for these again, uh, for out of round at the top, we got four ten thousandths of an inch, which I'm pretty happy about. Uh, service limit is two thousandths of an inch. So we're essentially um, got a large, large buffer there. And for the bottom out of round, we got zeros, which is typical. The pistons don't even go far enough down to really to wear on the piston, uh, to wear on the cylinders at the bottom. So yeah, that's all good. And um, Given these things a visual inspection, you can actually still see the cross hatching from the last time this was done. Now, previous owner had mentioned that he had rebuilt the engine. Well, he or somebody else, I think he told me that the engine had been recently rebuilt. Uh, so for all I know, it was a buddy of his or something like that. Um, he mentioned that it had been done recently. So the fact that we can still see the cross hatching from the cylinder hone uh, backs up his story. It's, it's again, it's a little puzzling considering how low wear any of the components in the top end were and how nice the cylinders look. Um, raises some questions why he was doing the rebuild and why it went so badly wrong where the bike was leaking oil and coolant and uh, low compression in cylinder three. Um, seems to me at this point that he bought an aftermarket kit, maybe not a very good aftermarket kit. And uh, the gasket, the valve cover gasket at the very least wasn't fitting. Um, don't know about the head gasket. But um, there were oil leaks all over this engine, so seems like that might be the cause. And he definitely reused the exhaust gaskets, so maybe it had been a part and he just reused the gaskets. Kind of a quickie job. Now we can head on back to the bike and remove the pistons. Um, there, there's a little clip that holds the uh, wrist pin in place. And so you need to remove the clip in order to, well, push out the wrist pin in order to remove the piston. Um, so um, picks work really well for this. You can use, uh, if you've got really fine needle nose pliers, that would work too. Um, just either way, try to make sure it doesn't fall into the crankcase or spring across the garage and get lost. Now I like to label these and uh, I try and keep all parts matched whenever possible. Uh, for the pistons it, it definitely is recommended to keep the parts matched. Uh, so I got a small tray here that um, I'm going to use to organize the parts and that's going to speed up the measurements we have to take later. Now we can clean up the pistons, just bring them over to the parts washer and uh, you don't need to go too hard on these. The carbon on top there's going to be um, probably some, some kind of hardened carbon deposits and uh, you can remove those with a pick if you need. This is mostly, uh, yeah, this job's basically for looks because uh, these are just gonna blacken right up as soon as the engine's put back in service. But um, we do need to clean these up because actually uh, we need to take a visual inspection. We need to make sure that uh, these have never collided with the valve train. And some little cracks can be tough to actually spot while this is um, all black and gross. So clean it up and then uh, give the piston itself a good visual inspection. Check the face as well as uh, the skirts uh, 
particularly in the y-axis um, where the skirts are longer because um, those will tend to be where they wear and uh, that will match the cylinder wear in most cases. So again, some polishing is normal, um, but we want to avoid deep gouges. And um, these ones all look fine. Uh, some light polishing, but actually these were in really good shape. So we'll go ahead and measure the piston OD. And uh, we want to take this measurement at a point one centimeter from the bottom. And um, in the direction perpendicular to the crankshaft movement. So essentially again in that Y axis. And uh, we're using calipers for this, not the recommended tool, but I don't own a three inch micrometer to measure this. Um, for this bike, service limit is 3.026 inches and every one of these measured just fine. Now we can measure the wrist pin bore ID. Uh, service limit for this is 79 hundredths of an inch. Third, we can measure wrist pin OD. Uh, service limit for this is 787 thousandths of an inch. And once this is done, uh, as well as a visual inspection, again, we want to make sure these aren't unevenly, unevenly worn or have any deep gouges. Um, once these measurements are taken, we simply subtract the wrist pin OD from the pin bore ID to determine clearance. And for this engine, service limit is two thousandths of an inch, which is a pretty tight clearance. Now we'll be installing new rings, so we don't need to measure the old rings. But for the sake of completeness, uh, for the sake of the video essentially, we can measure the rings for piston ring to groove clearance as well as end gap. Uh, so to measure the piston ring to groove clearance, you remove the ring and um, put it backwards essentially into the gap and then try to stuff a shim in along with it. Next, we can take the piston ring end gap. Um, so take each ring, the top and middle ring at least, and um, you basically press it back into the cylinder squarely using the end of the piston works just great. And then you use a shim to measure the gap at the end. For this bike, service limit is 26 thousandths of an inch, which uh, we don't have an exact shim for this, but we have a shim for uh, 25 thousandths of an inch, which is pretty darn close. And we couldn't fit that one in. So now with everything all uh, measured up and looking pretty good, um, we're ready to call it a day. We're going to put the cylinders away, going to put them in a box somewhere. They're going to have to wait there until we get parts, um, in this case the rings. And um, based on the inside of the oil filter as well as the previous owner's work, um, we are going to be going into the crankcase on this one. Going to check the bearing clearances as well as some other things. So on the next episode, uh, we're going to be dropping the crankcase out of the bike. We're really in, uh, in all likelihood going to be lifting the bike off the crankcase. Can't guarantee that's going to be pretty. And um, we'll get into the real meat of the job. Going to try and split the crankcase apart. Got a whole bunch of things to remove before then. And uh, it looks a bit going to be spending a fair amount of time in front of the parts cleaner. But that's a problem for another day. In the meantime, thanks for watching.